is irrational. If that does that make sense, it's it's that we're at, it's it's that recognition that the irrational is rash, is normal, and and we don't like it, and we can feel angry or whatever with it. I mean, as long as we're not going around like Travis Buckle. <laughs> yeah, so I think we have to find you know we have to find the irrational part of ourselves mm -hmm. that 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 that's valuable to our lives. Often in certainly in horror films, if you know, the monster is this sort of primal force, often that you, you have a protagonist who is very sort of complacent at the beginning and they have to find the reptilian part of themselves that is prepared to fight back against the monster and not be just destroyed. And in that fight back, they learn to be a more substantial person. Mm. So again, trying to sort of work out which irrationalities will destroy you and which ones mm. will, will help you. Laura. I'm just thinking about it, because a lot of the female Gothic, um, so like Jane Eyre and um, and like Anne Radcliffe, keep coming back to her. But again, they they all had rational explanations in the end. So I think you're right, that kind of making sense of it, because there were sort of monsters. If you still get that otherworldly feel, but through using their logic and their reason at the end, these heroines always mm. solve, reconcile themselves to the unknown. But, I mean, as, as you said that, I was thinking about with um, Wuthering Heights, mm. which is so fabulously gothic, but also that the the idea that these books are dealing with very strong emotions, aren't they? I mean, Joanna, can you talk about that? It, is it about the fear of strong emotion or is it or is it just that that's part and parcel of storytelling and making people feel a bit afraid? Is there something about the repressed emotion? Is that why the British are so good at these things? <laughs> <laughs> I I think some of it is about repressed emotion and repressed sexuality. Mm. Um, some of it is about just actually al allowing some screaming emotion and drama mm. that we enjoy. I mean, I think one thing that I would say about the genre as well is it's just incredibly enjoyable. Mm. It's fun. You know, it's, it's, fun. Fun. Yeah, it's fun. And it's, you know, if you want something out and out enjoyable and over the top and delicious and dripping with atmosphere mm. and you know, we all like a stately home and we all like, you know, mm. odd things happening. It's just so enjoyable. A good, a good gothic is so utterly enjoyable. There's a campness to it. Yeah, there really, is. Which is there is. fun. It's, it's so enjoyable. Camp. Yeah, it's a knowingness. Do you have to have a ghost? Do you think you have no. to have a ghost? No. I mean, your, your books don't always have a ghost. I think you have to be haunted by something. Yes. Um, I think in my books I, I kind of worked out that they're always haunted by the past or childhood or, or guilt yeah. or, or secret desire. Um, yeah. It's not necessarily a ghost, but it might manifest itself as something disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking of Rebecca, both the novel yes. and the film. Yeah. You know, just yeah. the memory or the idea of someone. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it helps that he, so that, you know, Laura to live in the film behaves in a particularly shifty, <laughs> shifty <laughs> man. You know, but it, but it is in, in her mind. Yes, but in her mind, yeah, just the idea of, yeah, the idea of her. Yeah, that's what's brilliant. Yeah. Rebecca yeah. functions fully as a ghost. Yeah. And yet, being a ghost. She's not. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's not. And she's not, what, she's not what she thinks she is either. No, and um, Max de Winstra. I mean, it is a work of genius. Like, it, it is. Really is. It's yeah. so cleverly plotted. Oh, so it's that extraordinary. You do just, extraordinary. just turn each page and go, wow. Yeah. Um, which makes me wonder, do you have particular favourites among the past masters, as well as having Daphne du Maurier? Um, do you have a particular favourite that you think, oh, I just adore that book, and it's, that's what made me read gothic fiction? I, I like a lot of the classics. I like just yeah. Joan Eyre and, and lots of Daphne du Maurier. But I like some more modern stuff. I, mean, I love Patrick McGrath, who's yeah. actually another Bluter author. Yeah. I think he's amazing. Yeah, he's Asylum is his favourite. Um, and Sarah Waters, I think. Her plotting is extraordinary. Yeah. And her second novel, Affinity, I mean, that takes so you good. That That's takes so you for a complete ride. And as a reader, you are colluding, you're being fooled, and then you feel like an utter idiot by the end. Yeah. But my God, what an amazing novel. It's a tour de force, that novel. That's an incredible novel. Didn't yeah. get the sort of glory no. it deserved. I, I think, think it's her best. I, I, I agree. It broke my heart at the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Without giving any spoilers it's if you haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Laura? Yeah, kind of everything Joanna said. So, um, no, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I'm trying to think of something new. Um, 
So yeah, I'm, I'm, well, I was like beyond black, you know, the yeah. Hillary Mantel. So the end, was like, yeah. I, I love that. It's fabulously so modern and creepy. <laughs> and is Shirley Jackson. Yeah. Um, and she's incredible. Um, the Haunting of Hill House is one of the scariest books I've ever read. And we have always lived in the castle. Again, there's not, you know, there's not a ghost, but it's just this very uneasy, very unsettled <coughs> feeling. Um, I think she's great. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Mary Shelley for being so young. Yeah. Um, yeah. She wrote Frankenstein. Seventeen. You're well. We were. We were. Yeah. Something in the teens. Yeah. yeah. Which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, I would be boring to talk about Hitch and just think Hitch is, you know, uh, to sort of take it in a different direction. Just you know, there's extraordinary amounts of Gothic, obviously in Rebecca, but even in Suspicion, oh. again, no ghost. You just worry that there is this psychosis and this psychotic mm. impulse in the man you've married, and you have no idea whether you're making it up or not. For your own reasons of weakness. Vertigo's got that same sense, doesn't it? I mean, he's wanted. Usually, and from from the French novel, uh, from the dead, which is yeah. you know a very gothic piece, but also you know the lady vanishes and Psycho have their elements. Um, mm. So, I like spotting the gothic in, in the birds. Yeah, I like spotting the gothic in in other things. Like he's, he, I can't believe that Agatha Christie people don't notice yeah. how still it is. Everyone wants to think about the mechanics of the plot and you know the city policemen and so forth and the city narrators, but. Actually, you know, these vicarages and these, these, these houses in the 1920s are, you know, are sort of represented in, in a sort of still sort of atmosphere of foreboding very often in those novels mm -hmm. when they're working well. Um, and so I, I sort of quite like spotting it in that. Because, yeah, as you say, there is this crossover between the crime um, genres. Um, so, yeah, definitely. I was thinking of the, I was thinking of the Big Sleep, actually, when yeah. you were talking earlier, because that feels very odd. Well, he creeps around a lot of houses yeah. on his own yeah. in the dark, you know, which is the same, yeah. the same as you know as Elsie in, in the novel, kind of yeah. exploring the noise. Yeah. Yeah. Her own house, you know. <laughs> and she's a, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Can I say what I love as well is that your title, The Silent Companions, mm. I think the very creepiest aspect yes. is yeah. The Silent Companions. Mm. Yeah. It's such a creepy idea. He was really lucky that they were called that actually because it sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> it does, but just. You know, it's like, visual. Like, yeah, oh, it does kind of the way they move. And yeah. just, just, I can just so imagine them. And yeah. I just think a silent companion can be, like you say, it can be guilt, it yeah. can be the past, yeah. it can be, you know, we all carry silent companions. Can you explain what they are without giving anything yeah. away? Yeah, so just, they were like dummy boards, like mm -hmm. a bit like a cardboard cutout, now they <coughs> but made from wood and painted. Um, and they were around the 17th century from Amsterdam. Uh, some people think they were fire screens. Some people think they were company for the lonely. Um, but mainly, they, they think they were like a practical <laughs> joke, so you'd, you'd position one oh, yeah. and make someone think it was yeah, like a waxwork. You'd like, yeah, yeah. 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 scare them. Yeah. So they were made to scare, really. Um, I mean, we were talking about Freud's of the uncanny earlier, and one of the things he says is that either what, what tends to frighten us always is either when we think something will have its own life and it doesn't, or when it shouldn't and it does. Mm. So, so we, very nearly human. Yeah, so we, we hate the idea of going crazy, he said, because we, we suddenly lose our volition um, when we should have it. But at the same thing, we hate the idea of waxworks that might mm. come alive or yeah. paintings that, you know, the eyes follow you. And I think this, the Silent Companions were an extraordinary fresh way of, yeah. of, re, of, of, of bringing that trope back into play. And Did, how did you again. find out about them? Was that, was, is that where the inspiration for the novel came yeah. from? It was, um, it was completely random, actually. Uh, a friend knew I loved history in Stately Homes and she was uh, touring one that had a silent companion in it. So she sent me a picture message saying, what oh, wow. is this? Um, and I said, I don't know, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, and we, we, we sort of found out what they were. Um, and I, I said to my husband, I said, they'd make a good horror story. I hadn't written anything scary before. Mm. He was like, well, there you go, write it, you've got to write it. Wow. So, yeah. You took her out for a drink after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a perfect the beginning. And was it, did you use the, the original Silent Companion in the novel? No, I don't think really. quite different um, Yeah, there, I did I did like a sort of Google Images search and found the scariest ones I could do. <laughs> you know, I was sort of trolling through and I would keep going. And, and yeah, there's some really, the children, I think, yeah. I use a child one in it because I think the children ones are the most scary. Um, there are some animal ones which are quite nice actually. Yeah. Um, and a lady with a sword I found as well. What, why did you? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the children are normally kind of all in their old world garb mm. and they're very serious, sort of puppet like faces. So yeah. they. It's like those Victorian dolls, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. Truly like creepy. And I mean, so many novels. Um, Joanna, I, I was thinking about touched. 
um, which was a novella for the Hammer imprint, mm -hmm. and and I mean, it's it's really is true to Hammer horror. <laughs> what inspired that? Um, well, first of all, they just asked me, so I thought, no, oh, um, could I do that? And then I thought, yeah, my novels are kind of haunted, but I hadn't noticed that. Mm -hmm. And then it was, yeah, I'd, li I'd lived in this village, um, which was just picture perfect until I was four. Mm. And I, we went back and I thought, this is really creepy. I remember it exactly. Yeah. But I also remembered a door facing the green. And it wasn't there. <laughs> and it just wasn't there. Yeah. And I kept going, I promise it was, but the brickwork looked really old. Mm. And I saw and saw that it was there. And I finally found a photo and it was, it had been. So my memory it's was just yours. my memory, which is not always so great now, was incredible because we did leave at four when mm. I was four, and I hadn't gone back till like the year before I wrote the novel, and I could have found my way around yeah. anywhere in that village, and it just seemed so kind of like a postcard. It was all sparkling and green, and it's just outside London, and it's near Elstree Studios, and yeah. very very pretty and literally have picket fences and pond. And I just thought, I want to kind of upend it and, and have a gothic, ghosty novel in bright light. I don't mm. want any darkness, it's going to be in summer, and it's going to be on mm. green. And because that's what's quite unusual, is that most, of, most yeah. gothic novels are in the middle of winter, we think of reading them in winter. Yeah. But no, this is the home counties, and it's mm. in bright sunlight. And I just want to play with that and see, mm. you know, what's lying beneath perfection. But that's that's very much something you enjoy writing about. I mean, Sleep with Me is is about taking apart this sort of incredibly smug couple. Of, they are so. It's Everyone wonderful. Said that. I didn't mean yeah. to be. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I mean yes, but you said that. <laughs> but you you and I mean. But well, they did need to learn a lesson. Yeah. 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 Or so, did. But in that you've got um, a pregnant. Yes, is pregnant, and in the Silent Companions, oh. Elsie is pregnant, oh. and it, it, there is something about gothic horror. They're either we, so we talked about the heroine in peril, um, but there's either children in peril. Oh. I'm thinking of the Night of the Hunter, mm. which is a fabulously gothic yeah. film, but. Um, but it's either children or women who are pregnant. What is it about the genre that chooses those sorts of characters? It is women, young women, oh. pregnant women, and children. It's Why? Vulnerability, isn't it, partly? I mean, it just mm. it ratchets up, you know, the danger and the, the threat. Mm. Um, I mean, personally, I picked. Oh, sorry. Go on, go on. Um, I picked to pregnancy because I thought it was that perfect space between the living and the dead, you mm. know, when the baby is in fetus, it's kind of occupying that other world, it's not mm. quite one or the other, and um, and also when you spoke the female paranoia stage, mm. things people see will be taken a lot less seriously, well, yeah. especially in the Victorian age, if they're pregnant, yeah. it yeah. would be dismissed so that... It's that sense of something... Something with it, yes. Yeah. Something that also could be alien. You don't mm. quite know what you're going to give birth to. No. So it works. I think it works quite naturally on many levels. Mm. It's a very primitive mm. event within our yeah. rational, social, you know, socialised um, mm. lives. So oh. again, it kind of activates all sorts of <coughs> deeper, deeper fears and worries. I suppose. I thought it was interesting that Elsie. I mean, in talking about this couple that were sort of needed to learn a lesson. I thought you were brave to make Elsie not. 100% likable. You know, she would obviously, you know, we could relate to her and, and care for her, but, you know, you, you're brave to make her sort of snobbish and proud and, and, and at times in the novel, and that was very, very clever, I thought, because it made us feel that she had to go on a journey. Yeah. 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 Character. the journey as well that she goes through, rather than just goes, please stop doing this to mm. her. So it makes you want to see where she will come yeah. out at the end and lets her character drive the narrative, which makes it so much stronger. She was really unlikable in the first draft. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She got a lot more likable as a <laughs> That's quite interesting. Was that was that why was that? I don't know really. I guess I guess I kind of thought all well, these things should be happening to her for a reason, you know, she should have but actually I I thought it was better to kind of have that hard outside and actually a vulnerable inside. You start to see why she's so prickly and mm -hmm. um, 
in defence of so. But with, with children, and we talked about pregnant women, but with children, I think there's something more to it than just innocence, isn't it? We think of all the great sort of gothic novels. Because children aren't really innocent, are they? <laughs> I mean, so, some children can do really... I'm just thinking Lord of the Flies, you know. Um, I think we idealise childhood, but when you think about it, you know, we're all a bit mad with mm. kids, aren't we? Uh, and, and we are living in that world where well, we don't know what's really real. Because, you know, I, I thought that... Did anybody ever watch that advert? It was a long time ago. Bertie Bassett, um, it was not licorice all sorts, and everybody was turning into Bertie Bassett, and it terrified me. As a, as, a, as a kid, I was convinced this was actually going to happen. You know? And you can't, you can't differentiate between those things. So I think uh, the state of childhood is is very much like so it's a yeah, kind of a psychological yeah. sense. Yeah. But they can also be a kind of receptacle of possession. So, mm. you know, the turn of the screw. Uh, yeah. have, have those kids been possessed? We think so. Mm. I was thinking actually The Village of the Damned, which yeah. is, was by chance filmed in the very village I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> now they're all, you know, they're all possessed and they're really properly creepy in the film. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, they're they're like yeah. 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 So, exactly. And, and maybe, and you know, Damien. I mean, there's there's <laughs> many examples. Mm. There is something quite creepy about that supposed innocence as well. Well, the children like the can dogs, be yeah, so. yeah, they can be remarkably cruel, and they live in a world of imagination. As you say, my daughter um, has not long ago given up her imaginary friend, and I did ask her recently what's happened to the rabbit and the child, child Daisy, who was a rabbit and was a cat. And, you don't know they're still here, which did make me slime. <laughs> so I just say play with them anymore, which is, but yeah, so Jeremy, I mean. I'm, I'm still quite a bit shocked, you know, I'm always waiting for my daughter to sort of look at something behind me in the dark and go, Daddy, you know, what's that lady? Oh no, I'm, I'm getting that free. Um, no, I, th I think certainly in terms of <coughs> them being frightening rather than the innocent sort of mm. thing that's often at risk. Um, it, is, it is that untrammeled energy that they can suddenly mm. generate out of nothing. And it feels like possession, especially in the middle of the night when mm. suddenly sort of starts screaming in the dark and you're sort of dislocated anyway as you come out of sleep and you're sort of struggling down the staircase. I, I sort of feel like I'm in a horror movie at that moment <laughs> with this sort of ball of energy behind the closed door yeah. wailing away in the darkness. Um, but I think often why, you know, the, the pregnant woman or the, the child is in this part of the narrative as well is that we need some taboos uh, mm. and, some, and some, some victims that no one can sort of justify as, as, as anything else. And so I suppose children being at risk mm. gives us a very dependable narrative hook. It's also about sexuality as well, isn't it? It feels like that that this idea of innocence and in turn of the screw is very much tied in with that. And that's there is that sort of darkness around children and sexuality mm. in these novels. Um, you mean kind of the possibility of abuse going on that we're not well, certain Well, abuse about. <laughs> or children's own, I mean, talking of Freud, children's yeah. own sexual desire or, or experience, which yeah. is very transgressive. That's, that's a good point that Jerry made about mm. taboo, because that is often in gothic fiction it has to touch a taboo, it has to make us feel uncomfortable mm. or uncertain about something. Um, and yeah, that is one of them. Cannibalism is just too <laughs> <Yeah>. quite <laughs> right for the gothic genre, so, you know, it tends to work in other sort of supernatural horror genres. Mm. But it, it is that sense of innocence corrupted. Mm. I was thinking about um, well, Philip Pullman's new novel, which steampunk has a lot of gothic in it. It sort of becomes slightly more ludicrous, but it feels like it's a spin-off of, of gothic fiction as well. But but he's got Nazis and paedophiles in there as well. So is it? I mean, are we ever allowed somebody to just be okay? No, <laughs> no, that's not what it's about. <laughs> um, yes, we? Well, sometimes they emerge safe but damaged, don't they? I'm kind of. I'm sorry if anyone hasn't read it here, The Woman in Black, I'm yeah. kind of thinking about where mm. the character ultimately survives, but not mm. overly happily. Yes. There's, all, there's scars, there's got to be scars, I think, mm. in the Gothic. And the lingering of, of the damage in the, in the darkness. 
um, yeah. even when you, when you think you shut it away and, and brought the world back into the light, there's a mm -hmm. little bit of shadow, like shadow there. Yeah. 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 So do you, do you, are you looking for the shadows when you're thinking of a, a new novel? I think I tend to write um, quite darkly, naturally. Mm -hmm. So it's looking for the light, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, it just... For all I can think about gothic fiction as a reader, mm -hmm. I try not to deconstruct or think in this way when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. I just simply try to get into that zone and, mm -hmm. and write. Um, that you're just drawn to, to that automatically. I think I am, and like I said, I didn't really realise it. Mm -hmm. And then there was the hammer thing. And then when I, I looked at a few reviews which kept saying haunted and ghost-like, and I just hadn't noticed really. Yeah. You know, you, you don't always know what your own writing is like. Yeah. But in a way, isn't that also <coughs> the image of the, of the writer and the author? Because narrators are very strong within mm. graphic fiction, aren't they? Is that also part of the one of the tropes of gothic fiction, you've got this sense of the, writer, of the writer, the author driving the narrative and not really giving you very much as a reader and, and just playing with your mind in this way and with your own fears. I certainly think gothic novels can achieve that mm. paranoid place and, and, and report that to the reader from inside mm. the uh, protagonist's mind. Um, even in the third person, yeah. we still feel we're right there. Every little inflection of paranoia or fear, or indeed, you know, a feeling of safety at a certain moment, mm -hmm. um, we 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 we're right there for that journey. Whereas in film, we have to sort of observe that from the outside. Mm -hmm. And again, a film like the others works. You know, it's a work of genius because we sense that interiority mm -hmm. in, in the central character without having to be told it or it come come at us in some exposition. It's so way. difficult to do. In film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been really difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. But um. But again, you know, fiction almost, you know, there's a different set of challenges because it's so easy to be in that space. But, yeah. but you know, one can almost kind of abuse, abuse that, that freedom to, to be in the mind, whereas, you know, a controlled writer can, can, can be patient and let it work. I, I was also thinking about how in all of your works, the, the setting is as much a character as the actual character. Yeah. So can you talk me through a bit more about why these the buildings, the the moor, the you know, why is setting so important for a gothic novel? What does it what's it what its role? Joanna, would you mm, it's interesting, isn't it? Because actually if you think of the Gothic it's almost the first thing you, you think yeah. of. Um, well I think in terms of buildings it's it's to, often to do with decay. It's mm. often to do with you know um, kind of nature taking over and buildings taking on a life of their own to some extent. But also because they contain shadows and they contain darks and they contain the unknown. Mm. You know, they're just ripe for a, a haunting. Yeah. Um, and then there are, yeah, there are lots of novels set on in extremely desolate landscapes, moors and everything. Um, they're often like metaphoric. They're metaphoric, they? yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're obviously reflecting what's going on. Mm. Were you thinking of a metaphor? I think I was just thinking that I'm writing a scary story. Yay, I get to create a big scary house. <laughs> but um, yeah. I think, you know, thinking about it, a lot of gothic fiction is about the sort of decadence going to decay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of the fall of the house of Usher yeah. and things like that. So a lot of it was tied up with the aristocracy and, and sort of mm -hmm. thinking, you know, how they, it was kind of a moral tower in a way. Um, and and like you said, at Moorlands and things about being isolated from society, yeah. that's a very... And something very primal, as you say, the, the yeah, it's sense kind of, of nature. And that's, that's a big thing, I think, that especially if we're in London, that we don't yeah. get so much these days. Is, mm. You know, you feel like you're in a very civilised place and then suddenly you're lost in a wood and all your mm. primal instincts yeah. and fears take over again. I also think in writing, we know this from poetry, that if you want to communicate a strong emotion, which can be quite intangible and ineffable, often, the, strangely, the most powerful way is to use a concrete image. And we've talked a bit about how strong the emotion is in Gothic fiction, especially in these, you know, we've used the word melodramatic in a sort of positive sense, you know, melodramatic heroines, but almost the strength of that melodrama requires something quite solid to, 
to balance against it. So I think having a big gloomy house that we can touch um, mm. helps at a sort of technical level. Um, and also, even if they're not decaying, they often burn down, don't they? I mean, yeah. uh, Jane and yeah. Rebecca, which obviously touches on Jane Eyre. Yeah, anyway. yeah. No, it's, uh, it's again, and that's also got the, you know, the, the monsters in the attic or the yeah, yeah. monsters from the inn. And uh, <laughs> the yeah. implications of work as well with the fire, I think. Mm. You know, it's all very uh, symbolic, isn't that it? sense of everything being destroyed. And, and, and also fire being both cleansing and judgment. Mm. We, we go into that. The hellfire, and but that does bring up this idea of a religious sensibility within, yeah, within I think it, it, fiction. Really, do any of you actually believe in ghosts? Have any of you seen a ghost? I, I'm religious, but I don't believe in. Well, I don't know. It's the thing. I've had some weird experiences. I don't officially believe in ghosts, but <laughs> I think that's the thing. I, I don't believe in ghosts, but actually, if I'm alone in the house and it's three a.m. and I hear a strange noise, suddenly. I believe in ghosts, <laughs> <laughs> and I think a lot of us are, you know, are like that. Um, that I, I have some friends that are spiritualists, and they they believe they have seen ghosts. So it's always very interesting to talk to them and get that perspective. Did you Did you talk to them for the for the book? I didn't say much for this, no, actually. Um, but they're very interested in it. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's a very very strange thing. But I don't think that necessarily has to be in it. I'm not I'm not sure the Gothic has to be spiritual. Um, I don't know what you guys think. I think it's yeah psychological first mm -hmm. and it may be spiritual as part of part of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to be I used to be much more scared of ghosts than I am now. I think yeah. a few things have happened in the later part of life that forced me to be a bit more rational but um, <laughs> I, I was very easily scared. And once when I was writing the smiling affair I, I was staying in this art centre um, all on my own, trying to sort of catch up with the deadline in, you know, in the small village in Cornwall. And I frightened myself so much <laughs> that I just had to sort of go to bed and put, you know, you pull the duvet up and go, we'll start again tomorrow. And, um, not, yeah, I think it wasn't a particularly good bit of writing, more just that, that sort of psychological snap point where suddenly your rational defences won't work anymore. And, and all that superstitious The anthropologist um, Evans Pritchard mm. said that when he, though he was a complete rationalist, when he lived in um, an African village mm. where there was, very, there was very much the animist religion, he saw spirits and demons. But he said it's because he, he'd got himself so immersed in that mindset. He didn't believe he'd actually seen something, but that created that sort of hypersensitivity. Mm hyper, yeah. not even awareness, but maybe. so is that what you're describing now? Well, I think the environment, yes, unlocked his, his yeah. sort of rational um, systems. I mean, that's amazing when you do hear the noise <coughs> in the middle of the night, you know, in the middle of a big city, you know, wherever it is. Um, it's funny how you, you have that Socratic dialogue with yourself, which ends up, break, <laughs> you break down your own defences and go, no, it's just creaky stairs, and you think, well, no, but... It, and that's, again, the slow pace of, 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 of the narratives of these kinds of work, I think, mirrors that that patient but inexorable breaking down of all the answers you've got that make it okay mm, until the only out. answers you've got left are the ones that you don't really feel so happy about. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is easier in certain environments if you're staying in a in a um, big country house or in you know, an old hotel or something yeah, then yeah. it's easier to to get yourself in that place but it's amazing that it can happen in your modern mm. modern flat in the city if, you, if your mind is open to it. Yeah, I can't watch late night horror films now. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what's great about some books. Like I was thinking about, I can't pronounce it, but like Rosemary's Baby. Mm -hmm. um, that's like a very modern kind mm -hmm. of setting, but it still mm -hmm. has that gothic undertones. And I, I haven't read it yet, but I think the upstairs room is set in modern times. Is it? Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of a ghost story as well. So I think, yeah. and in a way, I think yeah. some of those could be more scary for modern horror for us because. It is, like you say, taking that world that we know and blending it. It breaks down that, that wall of history. What, what about you? What, um, do you have ghost. you seen anything? <laughs> have you... Well, I would say, what is a ghost, for a start? Mm -hmm. um, no, but I do... I don't not believe, as, as in, I, I think there's just so much that's mm -hmm. unexplained. And also, we can often be in agreement when, you know, several people think a place is dodgy or yeah. haunted. You know, has that feeling. Now, where's that coming from? Yeah, yeah. I think we've all been to those places. Yeah. Strange energies. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. 
Well, that's, that's wonderful um, hearing your talk, but I'm sure people have got questions in the audience. Um, so has anybody got any questions you'd like to ask? Uh, there's a chap here and then there's a lady here. Sorry, yep. So, just ask. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite interested in the um, sort of tension between the Gothic and modernity. That when you think about um, some poets that are quite uh, are sort of embody modernity, like uh, Baudelaire or T.S. Eliot, there's quite a lot of Gothic elements to their work. And a uh, writer has perhaps not been mentioned so far, someone like Dickens. Mm -hmm. um, who's writing and documenting a city that to anyone uh, that was alive at the time is changing beyond recognition but all the buildings that are being erected like the Houses of Parliament or St Pancras Station are all Gothic revival they look like um, medieval buildings um, and I was wondering whether perhaps the continuing um, appeal of the Gothic in some ways because it's quite Janus based like that it, looks to this idealised past, but also holds a mirror up to what, to what... So like as a reaction to modernity. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Do you, do you think so? Do you agree with that? Yeah, I was going to say, I think, again, this tension between mm. the rational and the irrational, the civilised and the, the sort of more raw, unformed elements of our society and ourselves. But I think it's a great, that's a great uh, image for it, that Janus face. It's not one or the other, it's both. And without the two sides, you don't really have, you don't have the synthesis of these conflicting elements. It creates this unique feeling. Laura, do you... Yeah, I think there is that kind of reaching back. And um, as we were saying earlier, sort of the Age of Enlightenment, there was again that sort of Gothic revival. Um, could it be a reaction to sort of too much modernity and rationalism? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe too much change, maybe. Yeah, something... I was going to say, you want something familiar and safe, but the Gothic isn't safe. No. <laughs> but it, it's safe within certain parameters. Yeah, right? and, I mean, yeah there are certain expectations yeah. that keep you safe in a way. But, so do you think that's maybe why we're going through a bit of the Gothic revival? We've just been through the most technological social change that you can imagine over the last 20 years. Yeah. Is this also, is this us harking back to something more primal so that we understand rather than facing the fear of the I haven't really noticed it go away, the kind of ghost story. It seems quite enduring. It's, it seems to be like a common human fear um, of death, sales, essentially. It's so gone up. Really? Yeah, which is good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I feel, I, even though Gothic doesn't have to be set in the past, there is something mm. kind of comfortingly old-fashioned about it, as in, mm. it, you know, there are old traditions. It does half back as well. Mm. And so, to some extent, yeah, we know where we are, um, and but then you can play on that as well. Yeah, yeah. In what way? Well, like you know, just upending some of the tropes, or um, let me think, or slight parody that someone like Sarah Waters does sometimes. Mm. Yeah. So I was going to say with T. S. Eliot, of course, I think those modernist poets were inheritors of a romantic tradition, and, and the idea that suddenly the poet's own interior experience was was a good subject matter, and of course, you know, uh, damaged, dark, troubled, in, you know, interior experience, nihilistic interior experience by the time you get to Eliot, mm. that's very much, you know, something we see in, in, in the protagonists of this kind of gothic fiction. Yeah. This lady here. Um, so I love horror movies, I also love uh, reading um, horror film fiction. Um, I have, I know my answer to this question, but I'm interested in yours. What's different in film in how you build to a scare or a reveal than in writing? Um, actually, there's much less difference than you than one might think, because we tend to think, you know, films are all sort of dynamic and it moves. You know, the word cinema comes from the Greek word for movement, and that you know it's easier to sort of spot that more patient pace in. Um, uh, in, in, in a work of literature, but actually the, 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 almost the funnest bit of writing a horror film is, is sort of somewhere before halfway where you 